uh, called The Rebirth of the Author. I won't say much because I want to get straight into it, but I have um, sort of an admission to make. Uh, Roland Barthes has long been on my list of nice men, and I kind of think he'd like to have a coffee with him and uh, chat. He hadn't been, unfortunately, run over by a, a laundry van after a heavy lunch and uh, has been beaten on. Um, but I reread his kind of classic essay, Death of the Author. Sure, I mean, I first read 24 years ago and was uh, very inspired by it. It's a, a statement of a radical intent uh, that the uh, powerful, uh, domineering influence of the author was now being challenged and the, uh, the canon was being opened up to new interpretations and sort of liberation of the reader uh, at the expense uh, of the death of the author. And, and I did admit at the time, uh, in 1987, I thought that that was uh, quite revolutionary um, uh, and radical uh, and liberating. Um, 24 years later, I think absolutely the opposite. Uh, and I think the death of the author is actually quite a dangerous uh, essay uh, in its attempt to kill off uh, the human expressive subject, uh, the author, and his ability uh, to create a, a view of the world, um, to try and impart uh, that view uh, to us, uh, which we can then try and make sense of, rather than, in a way, giving up uh, on, the, on, on the attempt to try and make sense of it. Because, as Bart himself uh, says in the essay, uh, the removal of the author, uh, the death of the author, had two effects. One, to, uh, I quote, uh, render the claim to decipher a text quite futile, and uh, to amount to the death of the critic, and therefore to the death of the judgment. Um, both things, criticism and judgment, which I think we, we need more than ever uh, today, not less. That's just where I'm coming from, you can, you can disagree. Um, the uh, inspiration for doing this session was actually down to uh, Torio here on my left, who has set up a movement called Intentism, uh, which wants to put uh, what we're all intent, uh, not only on display in works of art, uh, but really um, back into an argument to counter uh, cultural relativism, uh, relativism, if you like. So that's a very important idea. And thank you, uh, Torio, for inspiring the session. But to introduce my panel and uh, the order they're going to speak, uh, which will be quick introductions for about five minutes each so we can get into the, the discussion. On my right here, Dr. George Sertes, um, who's a fine artist and a poet. Uh, he's won numerous art prizes for his poetry. The T.S. Eliot Prize was revealed in 2004. He's written about 14 books and poems. I do hope we've got some of them in the bookshop uh, because they're certainly worth looking at. He's a regular um, speaker at Bachelor of Ideas and Institute of Ideas events. We're very glad to have him back. I know that next I think we've discussed some of the, the, the issues around this, maybe the elite's uh, salon. Uh, and so again, you, I know you're very uh, clear position on this. It's great to have you here. Thank you, George. <laughs> Next speak will be Vittorio, as I mentioned. Also a fine artist. So we're going to talk about uh, literature and art here. Um, uh, the text, uh, 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 Mark would have it. Um, he's a very well-known portrait painter. Um, but he set up the intensest movement uh, to combat the same prevailing modes of criticism in society, uh, which really discount uh, and devalue a form of intent. And he makes uh, the point that artwork uh, should be not ashamed of, it, of its origin uh, in uh, the author and, and, and the human. Uh, so thank you for joining us, Victoria. The third speak will be uh, Dylan Co uh, Cummings, uh, my colleague or former colleague uh, at the Institute. Ideas. He's an associate fellow here at its, uh, Culture Wars. I actually published um, an essay that Victoria wrote um, on intensism on, on Culture Wars, so it would be worth reading that if you haven't already. Uh, he's the editor of the book Debating uh, Humanism, the co founder of the Manifesto Club, the Civil Liberties, uh, who have been well known uh, to many of the attendees. That's why he has attendees and have been speaking this weekend. So thank you, Doug. And last week on my far left is John Sutherland, who I'm very pleased to be able to join us. Uh, I ran into John at the Profile Books um, summer party um, this year. I was quite drunk, I don't think John was, but I managed to persuade him to uh, wonder him, actually, and um, persuade him to come and do this. <coughs> John is a very distinguished uh, figure indeed to be doing this debate. He's the um, emeritus Lord Northcliffe Professor of English Literature at the University College London. He's a regular columnist, 
um, a newspaper book, an author, his excellent uh, How to Read a Novel, I do hope, uh, is in, in the bookshop. That's where you should uh, start before reading any novels. Um, it's not too late. Uh, he's speaking later today in a keynote session uh, on indi is individualism uh, bad uh, for society? But I know that I have very fascinating insights on this too. So thank you, John. Sure, five minutes time. Uh, can I give these out to the audience? Uh, well, I'll refer to them eventually. That's about 20 seconds already. Um, well, thank you for inviting me. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to be here. Oh, yes. What I'm handing out there is an actual copy of a poem. I, I don't have quite as firm an opinion on this as um, I just said or thinks, because the question of in, um, the question of intentionality, for example, is very very complex. Um, the idea of the death of the author was that the author releases the text, and the text no longer belongs to him. There's a certain, I don't know how many people know you know that Dylan Thomas at one stage said about his poems, he said, let the little lyrical cripples walk on their own feet. Which is to say he was going to set them out and let them sort of wander through the world and let them sort of look after themselves. He was not going to be the interpreter of his work. If, however, you completely um, leave the text to itself and leave it completely in the hands of the reader, um, and the reader does all the work, there's a kind of implication of almost any text would be okay, because if the reader does the work, you don't necessarily need um, a poet or an artist to produce material which expressly um, could be called art. Works of art are constructed after a fashion. Um, of course, what the construction did, which followed from the death of the author, it did some good things. It allowed people to read against text, it allowed, which people did anyway. Um, but it formalized that kind of response in which you say this is what the writer seems to be saying. Um, but on the other hand, it seems to me that the writer is saying something else as well. And sometimes what the writer um, is saying, or what the writer thinks he's saying, is not what we think the writer is saying. We think that there's another case to this. Um, anybody who has um, had uh, book reviewed or under criticism will know that there are various opinions um, and that it is not necessarily um, the case that you yourself as the author might have the best possible answer to these things. It's possible that at certain times a consens consensus of opinion arises independent of the author which then begins to, if you like, exercise a certain kind of authority. Um, Victoria is going to talk about intentism, and I've read his paper, which is fascinating. Um, and I have brought in sympathy with his ideas, in fact. Um, although what I'm slightly concerned about is his use or the scope of the word intention. Um, what I have given to you, um, and I hope I can get the copy of it, <laughs> 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 is a poem. I'm not going to go next to Jesus, but we'll go back two and a half minutes anyway. But let me first just take you through some of the potential complexities of the situation. It's a poem that <coughs> came out of the book Real, which Angus has mentioned. Um, it came from a sequence called Flesh and Early Family History, which was 25 poems divided into five sections. And the theme was memory, but the first five poems are all about forgetting. All the poems in the 25 were five sections. Each of those sections was written in terza rima. All of that is part of the intention. It is also part of the intention to examine the idea of memory, of family anecdote, of the reliability of anecdote and so forth. All that is very, very clear. The reason I brought this particular poem is because it will possibly very, very quickly, and you don't have to rewrite it, not they can take it away. This is how it begins. That is the broad intention. Within this intention, which actually I had no idea at the beginning, there would be five sections of five. It was only after a couple that I thought, oh, I'll have some more of these. Um, 
I'm thinking of individual things um, that I want to write about, which are already, uh, under the heading of the subject. And one of the things that I'm remembering is a book I read as a child by 19th century poet Jean Nordetti, which has a central character, um, there's a series of adventures. It made a great impression on me. It's a rather wonderful book. Um, in this book, the central character has, having gone through several adventures, come back to his first love, but who can't, he can't find her. He takes shelter in the graveyard on Valburgisnacht and a whole lot of um, witches flow on. The poem begins, there is a graveyard, full moon, and asleep, a hero figure. Easy enough. Then at midnight, goes to Nathas and so I do to keep appointments with the wide awake. Already, there's a kind of uh, mitigation of intention, because the demands of the language, that's to say, I know I'm working with in this poem, mean that I have to rhyme at certain points, I have to cut stanzas at certain points. But there, an intention is relatively clear. There's a subject, there's a work, there's a method. But the method is itself modifying the intention as it goes along. So far, I know what I'm doing. As the poem moves on, and there isn't the time to take you through it, a series of ideas occur. These ideas have a ten there's a tension. One, there is the original intention to uh, refer to that moment, to the sense of looking at the book as a child and try to remember what it meant. On the other hand, there's this constant kind of modification of it through what happens in language. So sometime in the middle of the poem, I'm now somewhere I don't exactly know. I know that there's something over there in the far horizon which by instinct I'm trying to keep, but all the time I'm working through these modifications. It's, I'm, I must be told in the night time, so let me just draw your attention to the end of the poem. At the end of the poem, it goes to return, and it says, ghosts in the graveyard wail to other moons. Um, the stars have moved so far beyond the page, the stars that were on the illustration, they've gone right up the scale. And then this little line, small crumbs of icing in an empty jar. There was no intention at the beginning of the poem to produce that line, or indeed to produce line five, or line six, or line seven. However, you'd have questioned me, I wouldn't have known that. The only reason that um, line appears is because something has to run with far. And jar seen. <laughs> 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 it works. If you're working for me, and what you realize in so doing is that you're engaged in an act which is almost constantly kind of a, an improvisation around the given stuff of language. So you finish up with these small crumbs of ice in an empty jar, a line I've always loved. And I think, you know, I'm pleased with that. I can stop the point there. My intention is to stop the point there. And I do stop the point there. But I. What I do know is that the engagement of material with language is an, an intrinsic part of the act, and that I am not in control of language. I cannot be completely in control of language. I'm in a constantly responding position. So the pair of us, oneself, the writer and the medium, are in a kind of dance in which the writer cannot completely dictate the dance. So when it comes to the act of criticism, at the end of it. Um, the critic who's faced with this would find it very, very hard to go back to a kind of charisma and core that should be then called the writer's <coughs> Okay, well, does that mean then? I mean, uh, my criticism, I would have been more than word car, which is a good Scottish word for morning mist. I speak to you today representing the international art which started in London called Intentism, a movement which explores and celebrates the role of artistic intention by robustly defending the intentist model for understanding the role of intention in art and by creating intentist works. The title of this debate, The Birth of the Author, of course alludes to Roland Barthes' 1967 essay, The Death of the Author. In this text, Barthes asserted that writing is a destruction of every point of origin and to give a text an author is to impose a limit on the text. Our arguments are parallels with other things and movements that now dominate Anglo-American art schools with a shared conviction that works of art should be primarily understood by how minds receive them rather than by the human intentions that create them. In this brief time, I'd like to look at two areas of theory 
I'd like to leave us central to the debate. First are the new critics and texts, and secondly, Gadamer and the fine arts. The new critics wins up and is a seminal essay in the intentional fallacy asserted two things that would influence Bach. Texts have independent status from the author, and consequently the intention of the author is neither available nor desirable as a standard for judging a literary work's success. It should be noted that according to Wimsett and Beardsley, even living authors' intentions are never available. Moreover, if we were able to know an author's explicit, <coughs> comprehensive intentions, they would not be desirable. The meaning resides in the text alone. However, if texts are independent from authors and the meaning does reside in the work alone, then we shouldn't refer to it as if it were connected to the author in some way. For example, Turner's work or Derrida's work. But we do, don't we? And interestingly, so do Wimsack, Beardsley, and even Bach. Furthermore, rejecting authorship would be to treat a landscape by Turner the same way as we treat nature itself. We delight in both, but we treat the artwork differently. Why? Because we are recognizing a mind behind it. We see it as a gesture formed through creative thinking or intention. Any creative work is primarily a human gesture. A painting of nature is different from nature. An intentionally carved stone age tool is different from a naturally sharp flint. The human intentional gesture imbues the object with meaning. A further implication of these claims that were later developed by Bach is that the text can semantically change over time. It is clear that over time people have used words to mean different things, for example, wicked, gay, etc. <coughs> It is a contention of the intentus that when these words are brought together in a text, these words have a fixed meaning in space and time by the human gesture, and that any later change is a change in significance and not meaning. Secondly, a look at Gadamer and the fine arts. Gadamer reasoned that works develop an effective history as different cultures and peoples load new meanings. Influenced by Heidegger, Gadamer also emphasized the continuing narrative and baggage of our own lives. Since we are from a different place in time from the author, we can only understand when the two narratives happily meet, which he called the fusion of horizons. This narrative argument is very effective at interpreting texts, since they are clearly narratorial and linear. We generally start and finish at the same place, reading letters and words sequentially. However, Bach, Fuqua, and Derrida have all used their literary theories to understand fine art. Intentism as an arts movement argues that this theory overreaches itself. The reason is that many classic arts, such as painting, sculpture, and photography, are a-narrative. There is no order of experience expectation in these art forms. Furthermore, there are no public rules that say an artist can't ignore perspective or color theory in his work that parallel the public rules of language or genre. Without these public rules, we can either echo Derrida that meaning is constantly deferred, or we need to know authorial intentions. In conclusion, can it really be the case that when I speak to you now, I can communicate with you, however imperfectly, when I begin to write or paint, I become suddenly dead to you? Can you really no longer hear me when I pick up a pen? Do you really only see your own reflections in every artwork, your own face in every portrait? Are you really hermetically sealed in this bubble that no artist can communicate with you through their art? Intentionally skeptics would have us believe this. Thankfully, the truth is much better news. Let me finally quote again. In the Intense Manifesto. Intentism is a movement of artists, authors, and musicians who believe that work can convey the artist or author's intended message to his or her intended audience. Thank you. Great, no, you're coming in. Um, <laughs> yes, um, I'm not entirely sure what I think about this, so I've put together some scattered thoughts. I'm going to talk about this as well. Um, when I was at school in, in, in Glasgow, um, one day in English class, we had um, a workshop with poet Edmund Morgan, who subsequently became the maker of um, Scottish poet laureate and, and died last year. He was gay, and some of his work um, reflected that, that was gay stuff, I suppose. Um, but he had a funny anecdote when he spoke to us um, about um, a different um, school workshop um, where he had read a particular poem. And one of the students had said to him, he picked out a particular line about, um, uh, it was about a picnic. And it said that uh, there were two forks lying together on the plate. And the student said, Is it two forks because you're gay and it's two forks instead of a knife and a fork? And he said, No. 
But it was said. It's an interesting that someone is talking about that. Um, that, that was, that was a, 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 an example of someone reading something into the text that had not been intended and actually wasn't very provoked. <laughs> but there are examples where an author might not plot something at the time but would say, yeah, yeah, that's what I meant. But in this case, no, it's just too forked to be conveniently stronger than the length of fork. Um, <laughs> I think there's always a danger, um, particularly when you say someone is a gay author or, or a, a woman author or a Tunisian author or whatever, that you, you then have a kind of sociological reading of what they, they write, um, and that can sometimes impose on, on, the, on, the, on the writing in a way that isn't very helpful. It might be useful if you're a sociologist or a historian and you want to glean certain things um, by reading them. There's nothing wrong with doing that, with reading old texts and um, historically, but that's not literally <coughs> reading. I think it's important to make a distinction between that kind of sociological or historical reading, which is for sociologists and historians, and a literary reading, which is for not just for literary scholars, but for readers, those of us who read for pleasure and our interest. But I also think it's important not to think, not to make a rigid distinction then. If you say something is not, um, or has to be a literary reading, for me, the danger of focusing too much on the artist's intent is that it can become biographical. And what was the artist thinking? What, 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 what was going on in their life at the time to make, make them think this? Um, and I think that often well, what makes art interesting is the gap between the, the creator and, and the artifact. So it's interesting when George is talking about this idea of moving the text to itself as being the kind of <coughs> anti intensist thing. I mean, I kind of see that as being a traditional way of reading that the text is a thing of itself which is independent of the author, not in, a, 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 in, in that kind of sociological sense, but in a sense that it creates something. Um, and which, which has um, merit of its own um, and ought to be read um, in its own terms. You know, so you, when you're reading um, Jane Austen or Dante or watching films or, or, or looking at paintings, it's nice to know the, 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 the historical background and biographical details, but that's not the point. Um, unless there's something that you completely miss because you didn't know. Um, you know, if you were if you read Dante and you don't know about Florentine politics in the 13th century, then you'd be a bit confused. So it helps have footnotes for that kind of thing. But it's not, it's, 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 it's not there to be read um, and, and, and to understand those things. So it's, and I, I, I think the danger is to fetishize the intention that they often become biographical, and that's, that's an error on the other side, I suppose. Um, I later this afternoon, I'm going to be speaking in session on the King James Bible. And that's really interesting in terms of authorship. Um, <laughs> And the Bible are Well, the Quran, um, uh, for Muslims, is the word of God dictated to, um, to, to Prophet Muhammad. Um, the Bible is not like that, even to, to believing Christians. It's, it's the inspired um, word written by several different authors. Um, and you know, whether it's Moses who wrote the, the first five books or it was written by a collection of, um, of, of, of um, elders, doesn't matter. <coughs> it's, it's something which is which comes together, written by different authors in the end, which has a single meaning in the end. That's certainly why Christians read the Bible. There's an idea that there's something there beyond the intentions of the author. And I think perhaps that's the kind of germ of the jury reading of that. Because obviously Christians don't regard it as a work of literature primarily. That's what we'll talk about um, later on. But uh, I, I think that, 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 that that's an important idea, that actually to read it um, as a text, not, not sociologically, not, um, not, not in a kind of postmodern sense, but in its own terms, means to see it as something beyond the author or authors. Um, and for me, reading is about trying to find um, the meaning of the work itself. Um, and it helps to have sociological background, it helps to have biographical background, but neither actually take precedence over the work itself. Excellent. Uh, in cricket, the. Uh, sorry. Um, in cricket, the. Uh, the tail ender is usually the weakest uh, performer with the band, and that's how I feel. Um, everything I was going to say has been, uh, been scooped with more forethought by Vittorio and offered with more vivacity and more sensitivity by, by Dolan and George. So what I'd like just to use my five minutes for is just to talk about what I'm doing at the moment, which is reviewing a biography of Margaret Amos. Uh, it's published, strictly embargoed by the way, until November the 3rd, but it's published um, uh, and it will be, I think, a sort of um, uh, a successful book, but it is published, though in fact it had rather a rocky road because the subject, Martin Amos, effectively suppressed 
an earlier version of it, which was to be published by a different imprint. Now, now this book is, um, it, there's a description of it in today's Sunday Times by Richard Brooks, who had a page three slot on the Sunday Times to uh, deal with anything which is sensational and literary. This book is effectively, and I choose the word carefully, about who Martin Angus Buck. Um, it's a very impressive list, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> Even though I was around at the same time, and actually, you know, I, was, I was on the, just on the fringe of, of the world that, that, that he, he was inhabiting in the 60s and 70s, the new space and the, the new review. But at some point, um, or at one point, about page 150, the author says, well, there is a, a have, he must be aware of the fact that he's you know, drawn up a very long list of, of extremely sort of delectable, um, uh, uh, I'd like to use the word victims, but partners. <laughs> <laughs> um, he says, there is, a, there, is a, there is a connection to be drawn between Martin's seductive technique and his fiction. Well, I very much doubt that. <laughs> um, in fact, when you look at the long list, you that it was a very free and easy time, the, the pill, the 1960s, the general feeling that, you know, let it all hang out. But it was a really different period of, of moral anarchy, which in fact, you know, happened in the big period of moral anarchy. And it seems to me to be entirely beside the point, because first of all, one feels rather soiled at following this and trying as it were to to find some kind of connection. It, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was Amos himself who said that Philip Roth in Fort Noise Complaint had taken the, the novel all the way from the bedroom to the bathroom. And one does rather feel it that you know, literary criticism has been turned into a gigantic keyhole uh, for the prurient eye. And the other thing, it seems to be beside the point because even though there's the occasional insight um, that Amos wrote a very, very kind of other people. And uh, this book actually does suggest that there was a trauma in his life <coughs> from the people who was close to hang herself, from the woman who had an affair with hang herself. Um, and the, the novel and its, its kind of impenetrability is a weak one. But generally speaking, it seems to be, the design point, it seems to be the value of, of, of Amos's work is his voice, his extraordinary ability to you know, throw his voice all this than like a ventriloquist and in, in, into different characters. It seems to me that the that, and John Self I think is that's a key example. The, the, the novels of, of, of Martin Amos which are which are strong as the which, which have this this, this, this sort of uh, spoken this eloquence. Um, literally one hears them. Um, and that had nothing to do with the fact who he was taking to try to go and go to bed with. Um, and yet, you know, this in fact will be, this biography, I think, will sell many more than, than, than a monograph on, on, uh, on, on narrative tone and voice in the, in the early fiction of Martin Amos, like Cambridge University Press and other times. I feel there is an argument to be made for, for as it were, sort of keeping, you know, keeping the author out of the frame. And it, it, it goes beyond sort of the doctrines of intentionalism, uh, the personal heresy of it was called, didn't matter if it was called too fake when he wrote an ocean of water. Uh, the poem, words on the page of Derry Dye, there's nothing outside the text. Uh, well, there are a lot of things about the text in the world, for instance. Um, and what should be like, it seems to me that if, if in fact you're dealing seriously with literature, then there is an argument for the discipline. The discipline being like that of the intensive care unit at the say of the clinic, they excluding the extraneous in order to concentrate on what really matters, which is the word on the page. There, there is a kind of to and fro here, and I wouldn't actually say that the you know the, the reassertion of, of authorship, even though I just yesterday published a book called Lives of the Novelist, the History of Fiction with 294 lives, 16 pounds 40 on Amazon. Um that it seems to be that you have to you have to add a word to keep 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 a sense of proportionality here, either one or the other. And it comes down eventually to taste the judgment as most things in literary discussion do. Okay, can we thank our, our panel? Okay, just
two quick things from me before we go out to you. Victoria, one specific question, just to take us off. Um, you said, yeah. if I got your attention right, that the meaning of a text is fixed uh, by the, the human gesture of the author. Uh, sort of, uh, at a moment in time and space, uh, the meaning of that text is fixed and frozen. Um, it won't change, but its significance, culturally, historically, uh, may, may change over time. But is the implication of that um, then that there is only one correct reading? Um, okay, um, that's a very good question. Um, I think that if we try and break down what we mean by reading, I think that if you're talking about um, uh, texts, I think we need to work out what the intention of the author is in making that text. And I think speech acts is a really good place to start. Um, if uh, your intention in that text is, is um, something like um, making lyrics for a song or doing abstract painting or something like that, I think then your intention may be something that's not so concrete in trying to persuade someone to do something. But nevertheless, I think that um, generally speaking, I would say yes, generally speaking, that to, to understand the meaning of the work is to understand the intention behind it. Um, you can get, um, you can get, appreciate and enjoy the work in multiple uh, ways that may not include intention. Um, we would say that would be significant, or I think significance has been a loaded word that sounds negative actually, so have to be careful with that, because I think the significance is a wonderful thing, particularly in art, where I think in music it's more like adoption, I mean, it's a document as the song of your own. But if you want to know the meaning of the song, the meaning of yesterday or whatever it would be, a good place to start um, would be intention, and, and yes, it would be one, one, one interpretation. Okay, well then to open that up, um, for your brief thoughts, George, George Dillon and, and, and John, I mean, I guess I, I'm not entirely sure about that, I see it a bit more as, um, I like the idea of the human gesture, or uh, the author of the work um, taking, uh, expressing his view of the world uh, in some way um, through art or literature, creating that view as a unit, <coughs> sort of packaging it up uh, as a gift to the world, uh, to it, and handing it over. Uh, and then, as John, I think, was intimating, it might be a polite and well mannered of the author to uh, retire. Um, uh, from the room, maybe, and, and not uh, stare at you while you open the gift and unwrap it and say, What do you think? It's great, isn't it? Um, you, you really love it. So there's a kind of necessity for the author, not in making something a little bit irrelevant, I think, it's, as you said, John, to um, back away uh, out of the frame and uh, let the reader make what he thinks of the gift. I mean, there's brief thoughts, Dylan George, and John, and we'll go Very, very subtle distinctions between meaning, significance value, and I think that's what's so very hard to get hold of. There's something which I do, well, just a quick observation, the, the, um, an ironic observation. The great um, growth of creative writing classes at the time of the death of the author, so everybody's trying to be the author um, heading towards death, so to speak, when they're taking it on. Um, there's a particular thing which um, I do. I, I keep Miss Blake for him, it's a sick rose. Oh, rose are that sick, the invisible worm that flies in the night in a howling storm. Has found out I've had a crimson joy in his dark secret love. As I life destroy, I say, what is it about? And then we begin, and there's a kind of embarrassed little silence, because nobody wants to say anything first. And I say something ridiculous, like, you know, um, this is about bicycles. And of course you laugh, and of course it's not about bicycles. So then you go on and you say, okay, so it's about gardening. And they say, no, it's not about gardening. Little by little, we begin to work down to a kind of interpretation of a reading, a series of possible readings. Now, one of the other things we can do is to go back at, to Blake himself and to see what he, the kind of things that he has done, the kind of things that he has said, and therefore begin to interpret the poem in that light. Now, the question for me is, is there a final position that we could get to by that? And if we did get to a final position, i.e. if we did have this meaning, um, whether in some ways it would be a reduction of meaning, yeah? Insofar as if, you, if the poem is simply realizing Blake's intentions, and we can find out what Blake's intentions are, have we therefore closed the poem, closed the book, and we say, yep, yeah, that's done with. 
and I've been wary of doing that. It seems a wonderful example to me of a, ju a justification for the words on the stage approach. <coughs> in the sense that that small lyric which you, which you recited, it, it pivots on one word um, in its relatively few words, and that word is secret. Thy dark secret love. And it's secrecy which is destroying the, um, the road. And that is very much a Blakeian position, but it seems to me the poem is, is totally explicable in terms of you know, its verbiage. Um, and one doesn't have to look beyond it, one has to look into it and look at the words. And you know, I, I've taught this poem many times, and, and, and students very rarely pick that up. That in fact, you know, the worst thing you can do in a sexual relationship is to be furtive. Um, that it is which is rotting the road. Um, and you know, what, why in fact was beyond that perimeter? Do you want me to just no, 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 no. <laughs> uh, Well, yes, the one of our distinction occurs to me. Uh, I once witnessed uh, an incredibly stupid argument um, about 9 11. Um, someone was objecting to the description of 9 11 as tragic, and they said, no, it doesn't. I'm um, fulfilled the, the criteria for it. It's for tragic. Actually, it's comic. Um, it's, you know, it's a powerful thing falling down. And so that's what we're calling And put the back and forth in this kind of argument. You know, 9 11 was not war. So a literary reading of 9 11 is redundant. Um, uh, 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 and I think that's important. That an artist to be a work of art, it does have to be an intent, it does have to be an intention on the part of, of an artist. Something which is put out there, the, the parcel put into the room or, or, or whatever. You could read anything. I mean, that's one of the things about the deputy of that I, I could not screw it. They can get anything to be text. Well, why, why is our greatest author the one we know least about? Film, uh, you know, Shakespeare. I mean, so much so that one's not even sure that Shakespeare is Shakespeare. Well, let alone uh, Homer. Um, so, whoever he was, but I did. Okay, Miguel, uh, and then here. Quick, quick points of view, I think. I'd like to start finding out intention. Which is, yes. Uh, but through the process, something very wise in my perspective, which is once you publish a text or you know, painting or whatever you want to call it, the world starts editing it. So it kind of it also means that uh, people who are um, forced to see it, to read it, uh, also have an input on it. And uh, I also don't think that is it, are we really talking about the reverse of the author? Because was he really dead to start with? Because the creative writing classes was a great example of how people still cultivate the, the, the author and how the, the way that bookshops and libraries are still organized are still very much um, around the author. So the author in itself, or talking about the rebirth, for me is actually comes back from a, a celebrity culture where we kind of cultivate the self, a bit like, like um, yeah. Byron. Okay. Uh, and uh, and I think we should be talking about the writer or the painter and less the author. And I would kind of shy away from the okay, problem. First of all, John Henry, I mean, good point, but I, I don't know, I'm slightly cynical about the quality of it, as I was a creative writing class, but anyway. Okay, um, <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm a big fan of the Werner Herzog. Um, and in his early career, Herzog told an extremely assaulting, extremely unique stories um, with, with his films. You want to see a Werner Herzog story film, you, you knew it was him. Um, and increasingly in his career, he's moved towards nature documentaries. Um, and you can kind of see nature documentaries as being sort of, in a way, ideally authorless. Um, there's objections to that, but anyway, um, as I see it, Herzog uh, got felt he, he's in, in, in the 1980s he was pulling up, pulling you know boats over mountains, and nowadays he, he's like, well, the, the natural world and the universe is so fascinating. I'm, I'm so uh, intimidated by what I'm seeing here. Can, so science has advanced a lot. Can the um, sorry to call it arrogance? Can, can the arrogant author survive um, the revelation? It's an intentionist position that you hold, but it's not only that it reduces meaning if you go back to what Blake said. It reduces the beauty of the poem because you, 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 know, you reduce it, you take away all the magnificence of it, and you just say, well, what did Blake say? 
Yeah, well, Blake wanted to just tell you something without beauty. He'd have written it down and said, this is my attitude towards it. It's like secrets in your love life. He didn't. He gave us something that's magnificent, and it's beautiful, and it's beauty is the fact that we engage with it, not the fact that he's told us what to think. Um, before we all gang up on uh, Victoria, um, I think it is a question of balance, but had the balance not gone too far to the uh, hope that anything goes in the empire of the text and the <coughs> and it needed to be reset. So the content is not thing uh, is valuable in that respect. Secondly, that it's not, you can't kind of defeat uh, Tori Dargo by just saying, we don't know the mind of Blake or the mind of Omar, I think, because their position is that uh, the meaning of the work is the outworking of the intention. You don't pour the intention into the bucket of the text. And there it is, job done. Right? The process of outworking, which can end up on jar uh, rather than hard, right, is something that gets out of control. Right? So the, the intention becomes a different sort of intention in the end. So there is some subtlety to the not necessarily right over here and then here. Uh, it's possible for the intention of somebody in any sphere of life to be um, not uh, honest. So, um, for instance, um, going to the 9-11 um, analogy, you know, like the people taking the action would have said it was about one thing. You, you as an onlooker could look at it and say it was about something else, that maybe it was about the desire to be immortalised or um, to have meaning in your life rather than uh, what they claimed it to be. Um, in the same way, uh, Arthur Miller, when he wrote The Crucible, um, although I think it's um, accepted that the crucible is about McCarthyism. Um, Arthur Miller said that at the time he wrote it, he didn't actually know that it was about that, um, that he had a, a, a feeling of society uh, moving in a direction that made him fearful, but he didn't actually understand the process. He thought he was writing a book about um, you know, the witchcraft trials, um, although in hindsight he accepted that it was about McCarthyism. So I don't necessarily think that the intention is actually understood by the person um, and that there are various interpretations of that intention as well. Yeah. I, um, I, 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 I think, think a terribly good point actually. You know, you know, if, if you look at Milton, you know, Milton's great poem, Paradise Lost, was to justify the ways of God to man. I used to ask students after they'd been you know, reading Paradise Lost, were they better Christians? And none were. It wasn't that Milton misunderstood, it's that we choose to come at the poem from an entirely different <coughs> angle that he would not have approved of. Well, Milton thought he was of the devil's party in any case, didn't he, I think. I mean, they thought yeah. Milton was of the devil's party. Well, I, again, Milton would not have agreed with that. <laughs> 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 well, it's really the birth of man. We all know that. But uh, <laughs> I don't know if I'd be lying if you do. Because my somebody who reads um, novels and views paintings is that it, um, as um, Victoria I think it is, was saying, you know, it is a creation, um, it is something that's created by man, it's not nature out there that you're just receiving. So to me, it strikes me that it, to a certain extent is a conversation, that's probably not the right word for it, but um, when I read something, um, sometimes I, it, I get a meaning out of it, it touches me, and I might want to explore it. Further. I might want to find out what the author's intention was and whether they've actually um, created that intention successfully in my mind. I might not want to do that. I might want to explore it in another way. And I just, um, I, I think what's really interesting is um, that sometimes, you know, when you are looking at things quite literally, you, you might want to pull them apart, like you think at school, you know, they're not and all these sorts of things. But you might just want to wallow in the ideas and how you receive them. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I mean, one of the great things about this conference is that we all speak, and you may really um, not understand the intention of what I was trying to say because I haven't put it very well. Or it may be that you, you thought you understood what I was going to say. And that is the joy of art, me. So to, to kind of say that we must know what the intention of the author is, um, slightly scares me in a way because um, although I agree with you that I don't like the idea that you know it's just about how you receive it either because it is a conversation. Yeah. 
Victoria, yes. you're going to have 30 seconds to come back. Okay, uh, there's a few things actually. The one thing that Jules wrote, which is one of the people that wrote something quite um, <coughs> well in the bank engine, he was saying that uh, why, when we look at a work that is unambiguous, do we say, as John was saying, that um, with that particular poem resting in that particular word, that we don't need uh, the author? When we have something that's ambiguous, then a lot of people say, okay, we're looking to the intent of the author is now a right approach. <coughs> why do we need to, why is, is that acceptable that we can break the rules of our society, our homeless approach to interpretation, when one can do this and one is not? The Shakespeare play, uh, anonymous to me, is very interesting. People, I'm sure it would be a major success. Why? Because people are interested in who wrote Shakespeare's plays. Why is fantasy successful? It's, it rightly makes good work, but not great art. Why is it successful? Because who is it? It's about authorship again. Um, if someone lies, that doesn't mean that, that, that there's no truth, there's no genuine. You can have counterfeit notes, you can have genuine notes. It doesn't have any relevance on whether intention is where a meaning is imbued. Um, uh, anything else? Oh, okay, I'll stop. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, I think apart from intention, another thing to look at is subjectivity. And the point is that the, uh, an author and a human subject is obviously more complicated than he knows. And that's something that you're looking at. I think there's a distinction to make between whether you're uncovering the subjectivity of the author or you're looking at the complexity of the text itself. And it's not necessarily the same process. Wherever you can get to the text without knowing about the author um, is the text. Um, and if you do need to have the, uh, that, that kind of footnotes, then that's, uh, it's not, it doesn't diminish the work itself. And that's, that's <laughs> just very, very briefly, I think if Blake had wanted to write, do not be flirting in love, he could have done that, but he actually wrote the sick rows, and as, you know, Jackman over there was saying, we get an awful lot of stuff there, which is not decoration, which is intrinsic to the poem, which may arise out of that feeling of that uh, flirtiness. Um, one of the things that Victoria says, I, I'm actually very sympathetic to what Victoria say, and I do think it's kind of a redressing balance of this one, one way or the other. But uh, somewhere in that document, um, he says, uh, when we are in everyday conversation, we habitually know our interlocutor's intention without asking for clarification. Indeed, we become so adept at recognizing what others intend their words <coughs> that misunderstanding surprises us. It doesn't surprise me. I mean, I think most of the time we do, we are constantly listening to each other very hard, very hard to see what are the possible ramifications of meaning. Um, to work out, if you like, intention. But we do not know it, we cannot be certain about it, nor can the speaker sometimes be certain of the effect of their words. Okay, we're going to go to the end to two, uh, and uh, the back uh, there. So, uh, okay, thank you. Um, first quick, of all, quick, uh, quick point, it's quite a lot of answers. Just quickly, I love your image of the dance of the uh, writer and language. And I think that does point to the important thing about constraints and about art emerging not through kind of free expression of internal things, but through that interplay between intentionality and a mastery of the form, the aesthetic, the particular aesthetic form. I think between, between the interpretation of the, the, the reader and the intention of the author is the object itself, is the book itself, or the words on the page. Um, but it's not like other objects, obviously. It's a cultural object, and so its meanings and values aren't fixed because they will, nuances and emphases will change as, as, as culture, as cultural values and ideas change themselves. But I don't think that means in the Bartesian way that it's limitless because that's to disrespect the truth and what is actually there in the, in the object itself. Okay, good. Just pass along. Uh, I mean, we do have two fields of study, hermeneutics, um, interpretation, and semantics, the, the study of meaning. And I wonder whether these have become blurred. So um, we're so concerned about discovering the meaning we don't see the interpretation could be something further. Is there a case that to get that interpretation we can draw upon authoral intention and meaning and also draw upon many other sources, including other readings and critics, to get a richer interpretation? Okay, thank you. And then, uh, there, and then uh, back to one. 30 seconds. Oh, punch it. Yeah, George says something. The Jarl Hart question with poetry, I find quite interesting. You said in your opening comments that um, 
you, you chose it because it rhymes, and in that way, like, the thing that I think can sometimes be great about art is so, that like, we're inside it to ascribe wonder to, to things you don't really understand and so you have wonder for them in art. It's exactly because it makes logical sense to meet to the rhyme of the line, because it's rational, because it, it's sort of determined by your start, where your end might be, because it's logical, because you can understand it, that, that's the part of wonder in art. I mean, it's a good point, point. we did the death of the author, uh, Bar kind of gives validation to the surrealist automatic writing, right? With no constraint of form uh, or intention or whatever, and if you know what it gives, it's just rubbish. Um, <laughs> I think people made very good points, I mean, it is definitely a matter of balance. I just wanted to put in one other thing, that I think five people all sitting around a table will see and hear a different person, because we are human, we all have different experiences and come from different backgrounds. And that's actually something that's actually very enriching. So although I think it's very useful to know kind of what to help to know the intention of the author, just as an example, I think that that term, if we, that we stand on the shoulders of giants, that you can't create anything yourself without looking at what, what other people have done before you. So my book, not to plug it again, this is Birmingham out on the, on the bookstore. I was inspired by Marisol Sashak, a Czech illustrator who died in the 60s. And my book was going to be like, his old, this is New York, this is in Paris, this is London. And it's nothing like that, but it wouldn't have happened. And it wouldn't have been, it's a good book, um, if, if he hadn't written his books beforehand. And you need to have that background to be able to go forward. Okay, have we got two microphones? Yeah. Well, we have one down here. Right. So we'll work more quickly. So there's a gentleman here, and then lady just in front of you. Yeah, it's also on this question of the, the balance, um, because I think this is, the, this is the key question. I'm a little confused actually on, on this question, because I think we've heard from Victoria that English languages are uh, completely imbued with the idea of the death of the author, but then John's told us a story how um, certainly public criticism in the newspapers is uh, indistinguishable from Glow magazine. And, uh, so I'm wondering, um, you know, so what's, the, what's the real situation? Is it the case that there are these two sets of domains? There's you know, American English packages and there's the Sunday Times. But you know, I think it's important in terms of um, where and how we, we think about addressing the balance. Okay, very well. Uh, so yes, you, and then one hand to the front. No, no, no chance. This, in this nature of work, um, I think that it is intended to communicate. Uh, you communicate through art or through literature, and therefore, in being made, isn't your intention as the maker to communicate something or your intention, whether that's received in the same way that it's intended, is grey area, but. Therefore, would more successful work be work that is where you receive the intention of the artist anyway? In, in thinking about this question, we, it, sometimes there's lots of, lots of specificity. So, you know, they, we're all readers now, or we're all authors. Or in Christ, we used to talk about people being a painter, or a writer, or a sculptor, or whatever, or a poet, and they're quite distinct things. We get lost in this whole thing. But, uh, let's your hands here, just Questions, points, no more than 30 seconds, and try and get you in, and then sort of last thoughts on that. Um, when I went to Sussex in the 80s and wanted to talk about late and study and the great writers, um, I was free to give courses about uh, um, bingo. We had to talk about bingo because bingo is a, a difficult. And I think one of the things that part might not have intended, I think, at the point made by uh, Donald in his book, is that if um, uh, you have the death of the author and everything is about discourse and how it speaks through discourse and everything is a discourse, then um, you, uh, you end up um, not being able to talk about art really. It's, it's just everything that is in the text. Okay, and so two hands behind you, um, three. <coughs> yeah, you can come on two, three, and I'll have to leave it there. I've got this on your back, some critical judgment because. Um, are you celebrating fantasy? I mean, there are certain artists, there's a lot of artists in fantasy that are quite insubstantial in their work, but are major personalities. And I suppose fantasy would come into that category. Is this something that you're celebrating, or, or do you criticise their work? Okay, and then pass it along, um, and white, and then white. <coughs> Uh, you know, I agree with the with modern literature, contemporary literature, 
that you don't need to you know everything about the also because you have also common uh, points of references. But when you have not of those common points of references, it becomes really <coughs> difficult to understand the text. So I would uh, really, um, you know, make an argument that it is essential to you know be always content. Very good. Um, that was plenty of
that will come separate houses about the meaning of the words. We will never know the intention of an artist or a writer omnisciently, of course, draw their own baggage, etc. But we can write perfectly well to understand it. And lastly, one last sentence is why we've chosen a panel here that supposedly have some sense of authorship or some kind of knowledge in some area, rather than chatting to your four-year-old friend down the pub. Why are we having a book signing with a couple of the people up and signing their books? If all the shit has, doesn't matter and the author's dying. That's really the best form of argument. <laughs> uh, John, very briefly, uh, textuality is, is the focus on text is incredibly useful as a technology tool in the classroom. Good. Once you remember, this said, you know, Bart's um, uh, book, which has been alluded to several times, began as a seminar. But it seems to me that uh, for that purpose, for that utilitarian purpose, you know, putting the author to one side is, is a very useful and even necessary way of approaching it. Okay, we all think about that.